It is truly good to be in God's house and to stand here to proclaim the word. I have enjoyed thoroughly the series that, unless God does something different with it, this should be the last part. This is part number four. But I have no idea because it has expanded a great deal since I first started putting it together several weeks ago. And it just has never seemed to be the right time to do it. But I think and I believe and I hope and pray that it is today. I want to start by just a tiny bit of a review and put in perspective what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about today and ask the Spirit of God to be very active and present in this message because the excitement of what and who he is is the most prevalent thing of all because when we become excited about him then our excitement goes out there where it belongs because we cannot be God's voice without and I'm not saying that jump up and down and smack your hands together excitement Sometimes it works that way. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have the voice of God when you're at the lowest place in your life. And your voice has turned somebody else's around. So you don't have to be giddy and, and bouncing off of the walls to be the voice of God. We started with the voice of creation in the very beginning. Let there be, and it was good. The voice of God the Creator, however, the triune God had expressed in that creation, you can never eliminate that. But the voice of God was strong throughout the entire old covenant because they knew nothing of the Savior. We came to the place, the voice of salvation. Jesus, the name that is above every other name, that at that day, one of these days, everyone is going to bow. We bow our knee, complete and total submission to the voice that said, I have come to give you and bring you abundant life. And on the cross, as he completed his work, he said, it is finished. The voice salvation had completed this task. Yes. And I believe that I ended with this scripture from the last message, and that is where Jesus says, and we can go there every day, it's at, the end of, at the beginning of Acts. If you remember the Great Commission, he said, I have been given all authority and I'm passing my authority on to you. This is the voice of the Savior combined with the voice of the Creator and he's about to become the voice of the Liberator, the Holy Spirit. But in order for that to occur in Acts 1 verse 4 this was during the time when Jesus was appearing to them periodically. That would be a little disconcerting, I would think. You're sitting there eating and all of a sudden he pops up. But it would be thrilling at the same time. Because here he is. And I know I saw him die, but it's something real interesting going on here. And he said to them, they were eating. He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem. Do not leave and go anywhere. I know you're excited. I know you're not quite sure yet what it's all about, but I know you want to do something. Shut up, sit down, and do not leave Jerusalem. But wait. This is the only time that anybody had to wait for the Holy Spirit. Yes. I heard my entire grown up years you had to tear. Yes, and every time you tear it, you had to go on one side saying, let go, and the other one on the other side saying, hang on. And they had about 15 different languages and words going on in your face because you had to tear it. 
Shattering my bones is the word of God. Yes. Church, that's where we have to go with it. And he said, <laughs> right here, he says, oh, in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In just a few days, if you wait. Now, you know there was probably more than 120 went there to wait. Think about it. The number that we ended up with was 120. But you can't tell me that there were a whole lot more when Jesus was ascending, especially. There were a whole bunch of people who heard him say, Go and take my authority. And if you wait, I'll give you power. And go and you will be witnesses. And that means you can tell anybody and everybody. But for right now, you need to work on your relationships and prepare yourselves. You don't think that was necessary? Peter got himself a bad rap. Come on. He's not in great shape with the rest of the, uh, with the, rest of the group. Mary is still grieving. There's a question about that. And some things are going on that have to be taken care of. Why do you think he said go and wait? Because many times in the way, as we pray before God, as we're just there, things that we need to take care of get taken care of so that God can give us what he's waiting to give us. The same is true there. But this was the promise that he gave in verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I want to say something that probably doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm going to say it anyway. You see where the earth is placed? The last part. You don't take off and go to Africa until you figure out what to do here at home. Even before he comes as the baptizer, 
disciples had to understand their need for what Jesus offered before they could even be empowered. That has to be the case. Because the last time I checked, the spirit of the holy and righteous God does not take a residence in any form in a vessel that has not been transformed in spirit. Yeah. He couldn't figure out what to do if he died. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Let's see. I may have to back up. Let's go to 11 and put it in context. Paul says, in, in Jesus we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in, the, in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also... Who, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed. Yes. You were marked in him with a seal, yes. the promised Holy Spirit. Why is it necessary? Because he is a deposit. I like that. I like deposits. He is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. He's our convictor. He seals us, but we are still not in a position yet to truly be set on fire. Now, there are many others. Pardon me. And thousands of preachers and theologians and PhDs and RDs and whatever else kind of Ds they can have to hide their name that would disagree with the fact that the baptizing is important. But suffice it to say, this old preacher right here says, I've never seen anything that happened without the liberating power of the Spirit of God. That's right. And before we get in, we're going to Acts chapter 2. I think for those of us who have participated in and understand the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, I really believe this is one of the most exciting scriptures in, in, in the world. Everybody calls us Pentecostals. No, we are not. You know why? Pentecost is just a definition of a day of the year. But the reason it came was it was during the Feast of Pentecost where the most people would be touched at one time. You don't think God's got a plan? You understand that? It doesn't make me a Pentecostal. It makes me a spirit-filled child of God. Because it may not happen on the day of Pentecost. It didn't have to because it came and it's been hanging out ever since. That's right. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. I have seen a cloud, and I have felt the breath of the Holy Spirit before, and it is an awesome thing. Yeah. It's only happened once or twice. But this doesn't even sound like this. This sounds like it was a tornado that almost hit the place. There was no question something was happening, and it filled the whole house, and they saw to King James says, clothing in tongues. I try to get a good definition for that. So I'll just suffice it to say, that's what the King James says. Clothing in tongues. Now, if, 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 does that mean it was split in some form? I don't know. It says it was tongues like as of fire. What he 
and I've debated it for very long. Oh, it comes like as a fire. Now, if it stopped there, that would be one thing. If it stopped, and I also want you to think about this. Pardon me. This experience was a group of Jewish believers. I don't think any Gentiles would have wandered into their little meeting. That doesn't mean there were some listening on the outside. But when that whole place blew up, they started coming out the doors. It's the only way this could have happened the way it says. Nobody went. Think about the rooms you've seen on TV from back then, and think about the things that you could go online and see how tiny places were. They had to come out of that place because it says very clearly that the that people were around there. And look at verse six. They heard a noise. If nothing else, Peter was making enough noise for everybody. We can rest assured the man had a mouth. So do I, and it's a good thing this is where he ends up most of the time. Otherwise, I get in all kinds of trouble. God gave me this mouth so that I can preach with or without a microphone. But it gets me in trouble unless I am bringing forth the praises of God. Peter must have been heard as were the rest. There was a whole bunch of people in Jerusalem. It says from every nation under heaven. It didn't start out being Gentiles. But you can rest assured they were still there. And when they heard the sound as of a rushing mighty wind, a crowd came together bewildered because as they came together, they heard their own language being spoken. And what do you suppose this was? Uh, what do you suppose they were doing? Magnifying, praising, and talking about who Jesus was. What else could it be? Because even Jesus said, when he comes, the only thing he has any information about is me. When the Holy Spirit came to his eye, the only thing he knew to talk about was the Savior. The voice of the Savior who was now no longer a tangible presence, but now the Spirit of God is residing in them. There's nowhere for yourself to go to that. Remember when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit? Do any of you remember? I was 13 years old. That was different. Because you're not real sure what's going on. I knew what was going on. Don't get me wrong. I was around the Holy Spirit from the time I was, well, I was around before I was born. But I certainly seen enough by that period of time. I knew what was happening. And even then, it seems a little strange when you can let go of the thing you control the most, which is your tongue. I find it interesting that that's what he baptizes our mouth. That doesn't mean it remains righteous all the time. But he liberates our mouths to become the voice of the covenant. The church becomes the liberating voice of the Holy Spirit because think about where they went from there. Peter stood up and said, let me tell you about your history. And let me tell you what you did wrong. But today there's a remedy. Today, if you will come and if you will repent and we will baptize you and you can then be filled with the Holy Spirit. Did he not? The first Holy Ghost, here I go, filled message came from Peter that day. The first. Spirit-filled anointed message, and I say anointed as in anointed by the baptized. Yeah. Up until then, everything had to be done except 
spirit-filled people. So he was full of and anointed by the Holy Spirit. But in human beings other than him, this was the first one. The first of many to come. The church was actually born at the moment that the Holy Spirit hit the room. What happened from there became a matter of trust. Then you have to trust to let go of your inhibitions. To me, I never wanted anybody to see what I was doing, hear what I was doing, or anything. I just wanted to be off in the corner somewhere just in the middle. Uh huh. Lord, hallelujah. That's the way I plan to spend my life. And I used to tell God that. Remember me? I don't talk in front of people. I don't do anything but hang out in the corner. And I could almost hear heaven laugh. He has an awesome sense of humor. But you know, if it wasn't for people like me, the pastor and some of the others of us who are able to let the Spirit of God use us, it's difficult to turn loose of yourself and let God talk through you. And these notes don't matter. A human beings, if he decides to, wow, if he decides to do something different, they don't matter at all. Because the Spirit of God that filled me, first of all, He set me free from sin, but then He filled me. That's who has a right to talk in this place. That's right. And anybody who stands behind this kind of desk and does it in themselves, it's wrong. And I would tell them that to their faces. That doesn't make them bad people. It means they're disillusioned. Because there's no way you can truly understand what is being said without the revelation of the Spirit of God. Is that true, folks? Yes, yes. Moving right along. That day, I remember Sister Mill said they needed a dump truck to get everybody baptized. There were 3,000. And I dare say it was 6,000 because they only counted the men. Could have been 6,000 plus came into the first church when the Holy Spirit acted out and the voice of the covenant spoke into and started building the kingdom of God. Do you understand what happened that day? The kingdom began. Jesus said, it is here. But everybody come to hold up. You and I are kingdom builders, aren't we? Yes. Or do you just show up on Sunday because you think you should? If you do, stay home. Oh my goodness, I didn't say it, say that, did I? And I don't mean it as in please stay home. I'm saying make sure you know why you're coming because God wants to do something when you arrive. Yes, yes, yes. And on the other hand, if you don't feel like it, you better be here. There was a point this morning where I kind of went, really? I was so <clears throat> upset. My printer wouldn't work, and my servant's at the computer. I finally punched a button, and it sucked in the paper and jammed it. I didn't say anything, and it's a good thing I didn't. You know, enemy uses anything he can to take away from what we know we're supposed to do. Now, I'm not saying this is a barn burning sermon. It's burning this barn, but I don't know about those. And for that purpose, I need to be here because you need to understand what he did and what he does on a daily basis. If the power of God is not within us, the power of God outside of us can work very well. You can't control what you don't own. Now hang on before you blow up. You can't control what you don't own. Meaning you can't let go of something you do not possess. Letting go and letting the Spirit of God be our voice. We do have control of that. I'll say it again. We do have control. You know why I know that? 
because I know he gives us God opportunities up one way and down the other to open our mouths and be just what the Spirit of God said we would be, witnesses of who he is. And we say, I don't think I'm interested today. Check with me tomorrow, God. And you know what that does? Exactly what the scripture says it don't do. It grieves the Holy Spirit. And that makes my heart hurt when I think about that. And I know I've done it time and time again. Because we're too busy. Church, the church is too busy being busy if we can't listen to the one we've put in charge. Because what we did was we kicked God off of the throne of our heart and inserted ourselves. And I got news for you, the Spirit of God will not listen to you. <coughs> he has one voice that he hears <coughs> and one voice to give voice to. And that's the Spirit of God. I won't read the scripture, but I'll give it to you. In Acts chapter 8, finally, in a big way, the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. Samaritans were actually a mixed breed. They were part Jewish and part whatever. And that's true. They could have been an Ike or a Smite or whatever, but they could have been anything but part of them, they were Jewish. So they weren't allowed into the good stuff. But amazingly enough, the Spirit of God came on them. The Spirit of God came on them the same way He did the day of Pentecost. Oh, yeah.
Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why? And he's dumbfounded. <laughs> and now he's blind. And he's told to go to a man's house he didn't know anything about, and he can help him out. And somewhere in that exchange, God told Paul exactly what his life was going to look like from then on. He wasn't going to get married. He wasn't going to have kids. But he was going to preach. And he was going to do it for the rest of his life. Say, how do you know he said all that? Because I've been on the receiving end of the engagement. <laughs> <laughs> and there are times that there are contracts we do not necessarily want to sign at the moment. <laughs> Fortunately, Paul wasn't moved though. If you want to read about his conversion, it is in the ninth chapter, I believe. Nine. Look what happened after Ananias laid hands on him in the 20th verse. This isn't the same Saul that stood watching them stone Stephen. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And the Jews were madder than they have ever been. That man killed my mama. And he's standing up there proclaiming his love for God. Somebody did it. We're going to hang him. That's real. There came a time when he could no longer preach in the synagogues because nobody wanted him there. And Barnabas, being the comforter that he is, that's what his name means, he came along beside him and he said, You know, we might have to back off of this until the dust settles. Now that's a matter of paraphrase, but you get the idea. Doesn't mean his calling wasn't valid. What it meant was it wasn't yet time. Paul had a lot to learn. It says he went on the backside of the desert for three years. Now, I know a desert is pretty yucky. I can't imagine if you're in the worst part of it. But you know what? God would have your undivided attention. And he imparted to him in three years what most people don't learn in a lifetime. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was brilliant. But until he became engaged, he wasn't worth a nickel. Mm -hmm. Until God got the contract signed, until he set him on fire with the Holy Spirit, because Paul said, I speak in tongues more than y'all. I prophesy. I have the gifts in me. Because... Collision with the liberating voice of the Spirit of God after the voice of the Savior stopped me in my tracks. You know he told that, that story time and again. The one final engagement that is significant, especially for those of us who are of the covenant now, was what took place at the house of Cornelius. Here come the Gentiles. I don't know if you remember the story, but I'll show you. share it with you. Cornelius had been praying. This is a Gentile person. He's praying. And it says his prayers were being heard. Not only was he praying, but God was hearing the cry of his heart. He wanted something. He was hungry for something. And, and during that period of time, God's over here dealing with Peter, who's just mad as a hatter about this. I mean, you know, all the unclean animals he's seeing in his dream, and God says, go kill and eat. He said, what? Excuse me. I'm a preacher now. You don't tell me to do that. You think he said that? He might. He was one brash up. And God said a very pertinent statement. It would do us all good to hear it. Yes. Call nothing that I have cleansed. I'm clean. Call nothing. Nothing. Nobody. Nothing that I have cleansed. Do not call it unclean. Yes. And I'm here to tell you, Peter had a revelation that I wish 95% of this world would get. Yes, and that 
liberating God, of the liberating God that keeps you from judgment and misunderstanding and all that other stuff. Yes. Because He's a God who wants to free us from ourselves more than anything else. And, he, and, and while he was having that vision, Cornelius' fellows are coming after him. And I believe God said to him, or the servant said to him, somebody's downstairs waiting for you. And he said, excuse me, I wasn't expecting coming. But by the time he got down there, didn't take him long to get his stuff together. And he went to Cornelius' house. And he was okay with sharing the message but he was stolen when the Holy Spirit hit him. That's what happened. I, I, I thought that was just for the apostles. Yes. Amen. Yes, again. Yes, again. Would he really do that? Would he really cheat us out of something? to empower our everyday life. Would the God that we serve really do that? No. And yet, there's a lot of bad theology out there that says he did. Can't be healed anymore. You don't have the gifts of the Spirit going on anymore. How boring. Church would be dull. Because why would I want to worship and praise? There'd be nothing to it. Because I wouldn't have the intimacy yes, yes. as the voice of that who liberates speaks inside of me. My, my. And the church becomes the voice of the covenant as it speaks out the words of the Spirit. You understand? Because you and I are already engaged. Yes, I'm talking about engagements back then only to illustrate a point. Their lives became the engagement. But then, so do I. 24-7, I don't care if you're in a relationship or out of one. I don't care how much you love or don't love the person you're with. If you're in a relationship, you darn well better have God in the middle of that relationship and have an even better relationship with Him through the Holy Spirit or the other one's going to blow right up in your face and then be a mess. And that's not prophecy, that's reality. <laughs> that you don't know anything about mine. I've had 30 years of practice in knowing how to stay with somebody when the going gets tough. Right. And all I have to call upon is the power of God. Yeah, As does right. she. Because that liberating spirit gives us the freedom to be responsible people in relationships just yeah. like David was talking about yeah. today. We have yeah. to have them. We have to. We were not made to be alone. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. We were not. And when God blesses us with the package made specifically for us, that's the most awesome thing in the world. When God blesses us with a dear friend that is there through thick and thin, that is there when nobody else is there. You can call them at 3 or 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and they won't hurt you later. <laughs> that's a friend. But that friend, I would suspect, is as full of the Holy Spirit as you are. Because, oh my, I'm not saying this, I'll go there. Light and darkness can't walk together. That's right. That's right. You can't be bosom buddies with an unbeliever. I didn't say you couldn't be a friend. I said you can't be bosom buddies with an unbeliever. You don't mind because they'll drain you yeah. of your power. And all of a sudden you will have nothing to give because the liberation has been by the dark, by the darkness that comes yes. from that relationship. Yes. So we have relationship, but we have to be careful yes. because our engagement is far superior yes. to anybody. Because if we gain the whole world and we lose our soul, that's the conscious awareness of who God is. Yes. Yes. Your spirit is one thing. Your soul is another. If we lose our soul, what does it profit us? And there are a lot of people walking around today with lost souls. It's real. I'm going to hit on this and probably expand more on it 
next time. Empowerment, engagement, and now expansion. And I'll only begin it by saying this. The reason that the church even began to expand, they were having their own little clickified services okay. until Stephen got studied. And all of a sudden, the church got scared. And they began to disperse. It's called the diaspora. They began to disperse. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, yes, yes. in Judea, and Samaria. The church could not sit on the voice of liberation, the voice of the Savior, and even the voice of the Creator. Because when the voice of liberation spoke, they were in complete, unified speech. You can't have a liberator without a savior and a creator. Mm -hmm. It's the triune God here. Nobody agrees with that? I believe that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit speak to us in unified voice. That's what I'm trying to say. They have to. How do we know God? If he's, if he's just the creator and we don't have any way to know him, how do we know him? If Jesus, we need the intimacy of him who knows more about him than the Holy Spirit. One more. He said he will testify of me. At creation, he said, let us. Do you understand what I'm saying? The voice of the covenant will ring throughout the ages until... For me, until the way I understand it, the trumpet sounds Amen. and the dispensation of grace is gone. Amen. Because once that's gone, whatever happens after that, I don't really expect I'm going to participate in it. <laughs> if so, I spent a lot of years believing I wasn't. Believing that I belonged to Jesus and I don't think there's anything phony or there's anything half-baked about that. Yeah. Because there's one thing, this world and its mouth and its stuff cannot take from me. And that's my Jesus. That's right. right. Yes. Yeah. 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 They've tried a million different ways. Even my parents, even your parents, for some of you. My family, my family lives about 15 minutes from here. I have not seen them. Some members of my family I have not seen since 1989. And that was only because they had to for a few months. Why is that? Well, if people don't really believe that you're a contributing member of society and they think you're being heretical in claiming Jesus, why would you go there? It doesn't mean I hate them. It just means the relationship's not possible. Because I'm going to say it this way. It's not light and darkness, but it's skewed. Yes. Yeah. And the reason it's skewed is from the same prism comes the same light. Anything that skews it is something that gets in the way, right? Did I say that right? I'm looking for you. But that cuts its ability to come forth in its purity. And that's not God's best for us. We're so fortunate to have Mother Trout, Grandmother, and William, and Sue. We are so fortunate to have them here. And Cindy, oh, I always forget, because she's, she's just one of us. And uh, let me see, there's somebody else. Uh, let me see. Oh, but she doesn't like people very much. Her name's Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Marsha. We'll stick together. I love her very much. Y'all don't know how much I love this woman. I really do. She sings next to me and puts up with all my bad notes. We are so fortunate. We are so fortunate to have people who 
part like us. But love us. Yes, hallelujah. Because they truly understand the voice of the Creator. Yes. yes. And the experience of the Spirit and empowerment of God. Because you know as well as I do, it isn't easy to hang out with us. Because assumptions are always made. Those could be fighting words. But when you're hearing one voice, and you know you're attached to one voice, you don't have to worry too much about who's with you or what people think. I think most of us stopped caring a long time ago because they don't know what lives in here. That's right. Neither does your partner, just him. If you don't understand the voice of the liberating power of the Holy Spirit, just ask Him. So you don't have to wait on anything. You just say, Lord, I want this. One of the scriptures I had and I didn't read it is by the laying on of hands that you can receive the Spirit now. Just by the laying on of hands. Why do I need it? So you can get out of bed every morning. A child of God. You can get out of bed and wish to God you didn't. But if we're going to do anything to expand ourselves in the kingdom, he's going to get me up in the morning. I may growl at him, but I'll get up. <clears throat> and after what we heard today for, through the mouth of God, through Brother David, after hearing that, it makes me stop and think about the times I miss being the voice of God to the people I work with. I usually get it when I'm around other people. I sort of act okay. I'm telling myself. When I'm at work, it's like, would you just get out of my way? I'm here. I'm doing my thing. Just leave me that way. It's so wrong. Because <coughs> if I say, that my voice becomes the voice of him who wishes to expand the kingdom. I don't have a right to do that. So I was feeling kind of convicted about all that. So I started praying for the boss I don't like so that God would help me like her. Because maybe I'll go from like to love. She's a hard woman. She's too much like me. She just bleh, says it the way she thinks and God says it. So. You know, that, that, that's a problem because I can do that, but <laughs> seriously, those of us who work in difficult environments, God was telling us something this morning. Pray for them, love them. Yes. Because we don't have a clue what kind of nightmare they will come from this morning. That's right.